Well, about a week and a half ago, I was sitting down during my normal quiet time with God, just reading my Bible, and I came across a passage from 2 Samuel chapter 7. And as I was reading the passage, a story about King David, I was, God really put a pretty important lesson on my heart that day, and I thought to myself, this would be a great lesson to share with the entire congregation. Then I closed my Bible up and went about my day and got busy, and then about five and a half hours later, I had a meeting with Marty Grubbs, and he goes, hey, I want you to preach next Sunday. So I have a feeling that the lesson that God gave me that morning is a lesson that God also wants you to hear today. I'm thrilled that we get to all gather here in this room today. No matter where you are from, whatever room you're joining us in, I'm thrilled you're here. But I'd like us to take a moment and have a special welcome to our brothers at Joseph Harp. Some of you guys may not know that our brothers at Joseph Harp have been caught up in the statewide prison lockdown, and it has been five weeks since they've been able to gather on Sunday evenings for worship. And so today, right now, is their very first week back to worship as a church, and I can only imagine that their worship was the loudest worship in all of our rooms today. So we're thrilled to have you guys back. The main lesson that God put on my heart that day as I was reading my Bible was this, is that we do not bring God along to be a part of what we are doing. We don't bring God along to be a part of what we are doing. Instead, God invites us to come along and be a part of what he is doing. We don't bring God along to be a part of what we are doing. Instead, God invites us to come along and be a part of what he is doing. I think it's a very important message that we need to understand today, and we're going to get into the text, and I'm going to work through the text to explain this concept and why it was so important to me and why I feel like it's so important to understand this at this time of our church in the middle of this Go campaign. We need to know that it is God who is at work right now. He's inviting us to come along and be a part of it. But to help you understand the lesson that God gave me that day, the first thing I think you need to do is get inside my head. And I apologize in advance. We're going to go down a weird rabbit hole here inside my head. But this is how I think. And uh, my wife is here today, and she'll tell you I, I, I've just, I have some issues. But we want to get inside my head. And the first thing you need to understand about me is that I was born in 1985, which makes me 34 years old, which makes me a millennial. And I hate, I hate being called a millennial because a lot of you guys that I'm looking at right now, you're not millennials and you give us such a bad reputation. You know, we, we have a bad reputation. We have this reputation that we don't work hard, that we live with our parents too long, that we're always looking for handouts. And, and, and there's, there's a bit of that that's true. There's always a kernel of truth in these things. We had a guy here over the summer who was part of our leadership summit. And he was a millennial who was talking about other millennials in the workforce. And he was telling this story about his brother who is 30 years old. And he found out one day that his brother who is 30 is still getting his insurance paid for by his parents. And so he was so mad about this when he found out his brother was still getting his insurance paid. And he decided to storm into his parents' house. And he goes up to his mom to confront her about this. And at the last second, he decides to stop because he's afraid his mom may get mad at him and take away his gas card. Right. So there's a, there's a kernel of truth in all of these things, but I hope I can be a good representative for my generation here today. But what you need to understand about millennials, the reason I bring this up is that we don't trust anyone. We, we've, we are a generation that has been lied to constantly. Right now, whenever I go and read the news, when I consume the news for myself, I have to go to three separate places to make sure I know what I'm getting is fact and not exaggerated opinion. We are the generation that was told that this social network thing, which is our fault, I understand, but this social network thing was going to bring us closer together when in fact it has just torn us apart. It has isolated us in ways from anything that resembles a real relationship. You know, we are the generation that has been exposed to scandal after scandal in some major church institutions, right? We have been lied to constantly. And as a result, we tend not to trust people. We tend to trust ourselves before we trust others. Now, 
One thing I also want you to know about our generation though, is that I do feel like for the most part, we try to do good. You know, we try to do, you know, to, to make the world a better place, whatever that means. We, we try to go and do good in society. We try to do what we believe to be right. We want to do the right thing. But in this world today, you have to understand that being right or what is the right thing is a very subjective answer. And so it's led me lately to start asking the question to myself and to a lot of people around me, if we wanna do the right thing, who is it that gets to determine what is right? Who gets to determine what is right and what is wrong? If we're all trying to go do the right thing, who gets to decide? If you look back and you look at the answer to this question, what you'll normally find is that the person or the people groups who get to determine what is right are the groups who hold the most power at that point in time. If being right is subjective, whoever has the most power can coerce the group who has less power to determine what is right at that point in time. I want you to think about this. This may be a military power, it may be an economic power, maybe a cultural power. If you go back to 30s and 40s Nazi Germany, the military power and the cultural power of Nazi Germany was able to redefine to millions of people in a very short amount of time what is right. But here's the thing, I actually agree with the principle that whoever has the power gets to determine what is right. The bigger question is, who has the power? And as you read in your Bible, you're gonna find in this text, especially back in the Old Testament, you're gonna find story after story of great men and women who thought they had the power. You're gonna find great military leaders like Nebuchadnezzar, who at that time thought they were the most powerful in all the world. You'll find people like Cyrus the Great, you'll find all these amazing characters in the Bible who thought they had the power. But at every turn in the story, what we find is that God always had the power. The greatest military leaders of all time have bent to the will of God in the pages of history. And then if we go forward in time, if we look into the future, we read Revelation, what we'll find is that in the end of days, it is God who is holding the ultimate power. And so if God has the power in the future and he had the power in the past, we can conclude that today, it is God who has the power, which means that it's God's prerogative and his prerogative alone to determine what is right. What is right, what is good, what is bad, what is evil, what is joyfulness, what is peace, what is prosperity, what is love. It is God's prerogative and his prerogative alone to determine what is right. Personally, I take a lot of freedom in knowing that I'm not having to chase whoever has the most power right now to determine what is right. I can follow a sovereign God who will always have the most power to tell me what is right. But this is my concern with the millennials. I wanna come back to the millennials. As a generation, in, in, in large you know, terms speaking here, as a generation, we have bought into a lie. And the lie is this. The lie is that we believe we have the power. We believe we have the power to determine what is right, that we can look within ourselves, determine who we are, and from that wisdom, we have the power to both know what is right and go and do what is right. Like I said, we want to be a generation that does the right thing. But if we lean upon our own power and our own understanding, when we go and we do the right thing, we tend to do it in the way that is right in our own eyes. And God's people have fallen into this trap time and time again. One of the most famous stories of this is the story of the judges. And in the time of the judges, God's people had, had come out of the wilderness and they had gone into the promised land and all the tribes of Israel had been given their allotments of land. And the people settled into that time. But slowly, slowly, gradually, the outside cultures of that region started creeping into the people. And, and we see them start to integrate other idols and start to just turn their eyes away from God. And in chapter 21 of the book of Judges, we see this beautiful passage, this famous passage, 
that says there was no king in Israel and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. My, when you read that story in Judges, when you go to the end of that story in Judges, as everyone is going and doing what is right in their own eyes, what you feel when you read that story is this heaviness, this, this darkness. When everyone's doing what is right in their own eyes, they start to just have chaos with each other. The way I like to think about it is imagine, imagine that you are at a marathon race and there's 10,000 runners lining up at the starting line to run that race. And whenever the, the, the gun is fired to start the race, instead of, instead of everyone running in order, everyone runs in the direction that they believe is right in their own eyes and they trample each other in the chaos. That's what happens when we do what is right in our own eyes. And my concern is that as a generation, as a millennial, is that we will allow this thought to creep into the church and we will allow this thought to creep into how we personally serve our God. We begin to go out and do what we think is right with the best of intentions in our heart. But what we're doing is we're trying to do what is right in our own eyes. We're trying to bring God along to be a part of what we are doing, what we think is right. Instead of understanding this truth, that God is the one who has the power, God is the one who knows what is right. God is the one who is at work. He is at work doing a great, great thing, and he's inviting us in his love to come along and be a part of it. I wanna show you in this text today, in 2 Samuel chapter seven, I wanna show you how this plays out with a guy named King David. And at this time in 2 Samuel chapter seven, in the life of King David, this is about a thousand years or so before Christ. And David has been raised up to be king over Israel. This is after the time of the judges. God had raised up a man named Saul. Saul failed as a king in many ways. And so God raises up a man after his own heart named David. And David, at this point, Saul has died and Jonathan has died. And all of Saul's descendants have really stopped seeking the throne from David. David has had incredible military victories. He's brought the Ark of the Covenant back from the Philistines. It's back to Israel. And for the first time in David's life, his adult life, the first time as king of Israel, the kingdom's unified and he seems to be at rest, at least temporarily. He's not having wars. There's no one really attacking him at this point. And so David finds himself sitting there in this time of rest, trying to do what he genuinely believes to be right. Let me read this first, path, first verse in this chapter. Chapter seven, verse one says this. Now, when the king lived in his house, and the Lord had given him rest from all his surrounding enemies, the king said to Nathan the prophet, see now I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells in a tent. What David is saying here is that he's talking about the ark of the covenant. And the ark of the covenant was this beautiful structure that God had commanded Moses and the people to build at the time of the wilderness. The ark of the covenant contained the tablets of stone that had been given to Moses by God. And so David is looking and he's seeing that he's in this beautiful home right now and the Ark of the Covenant, this thing that is so precious to God is in a tent and he just feels bad and he wants to do the right thing. He wants to build a house for the Ark. He wants to build a house for God. What he wants to do is he wants to build the temple of Jerusalem. So David goes to the prophet Nathan to seek his counsel and then God will come to his prophet Nathan at night and respond with this guidance to David. Let me read you verse four. It says, but that same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan. Go and tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, would you build me a house to dwell in? I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day, but I've been moving about in a tent for my dwelling. God goes on to pretty much tell David, he goes, I know you want me to build, a, you want to build a house for me, but I've never commanded you to do this. This is not what I desire right now. This has not been a commandment of, of mine. Now, in First Chronicles, we get a bit more context as to why God may not have wanted David to build that house right now. Didn't want David to be the one who built the temple. We find that God tells David that you have been a man of war. You have shed a lot of blood. And I want the king who will build my temple, a king who will be your son, a man named Solomon, I want that, the person who builds my temple, to be a king in time of peace. 
And my personal opinion as to one of the reasons that may be is if you go and you look at the customs of the time, what you'll find is that in that area, in those regions, these conquering kings and all the kingdoms throughout would go and they would have these massive military conquests. And then when they would come back, if they were to win the military conquest, they'd come back into the capital city and they would erect some sort of monument to the local god. And it would be like a view of this God sponsored me in my military battle and now this God sponsors me in my political reign, right? And so if David were to have built that temple right then after he just had this great victory over the Philistines, the glory of that temple probably wouldn't have gone to God. The glory of that temple would have gone to King David. People were already singing songs about King David. God wanted the glory to go to him. He wanted his people to be set apart, to be holy, to be different from all the others, right? He wants David to be different. He wants his kingdom to be different from all the other kingdoms around. So God then gives David a response. And if you look here in verse 11, halfway through verse 11, God makes something pretty incredible known to David. He wants to tell him what is going on. He goes, I know that you wanted to build me a house. I know you wanted to do something good, but you need to understand I am at work here and I'm wanting you to come along and be a part of it. And not only is it that, I've got some pretty big promises for you. God tells David this. He goes, moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. Whenever, whenever God says this, that the Lord will make you a house, he's not talking about a structure. He's talking about a house like in terms of the word dynasty. Think about the house of Windsor and the royal family. He's saying, I'm gonna make you a dynasty of kings. He goes, when your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. What God is saying in this passage is he says, David, before you got to this point, I was with you. He goes, I am the one who brought you out of the pastures. I'm the one who made you prince of my people. I am the one who went out there and fought your battles. Not only was I with you though, I'm making a very big promise to you. I'm saying that you wanted to build me a house, I'm gonna build you a dynasty. Kings are gonna come after you, David. Kings are gonna come after you. If David were to step back in that moment, which I suspect he did, he would have understood the entire context of what God was trying to communicate to him. See, God's trying to say, I am at work. I am doing a great thing. I'm inviting you to come along to it. And let me explain to you what all has been going on because I've been at work for a number of years, for a long, long time. You see, centuries before, God made a promise to a man named Abraham. And Abraham had a son named Isaac who had a son named Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons. They were the 12 tribes of Israel. One of those sons was a man named Judah. And God communicated to this man named Judah that one day kings would come from your line. One day the Messiah would come from the line of Judah. And then years later, as Moses is leading his people out of Israel, as, Mo as God is using Moses to lead his people out of Israel, at the end of the 40 years, they get to this place right before they go into the promised land. They come to a place called Moab. Moab is about 50 miles east of Jerusalem. And in that place, the king of Moab looks at all of these Israelites, this, this horde of Israelites, and he has heard the stories of all these military victories that the Israelites had had, and he's scared. He's afraid he's gonna be overrun. And so he does what he thinks is right in his eyes, and he calls this pagan prophet named Balaam down to come and curse God's people, thinking that's how he will get rid of these guys. And Balaam comes down to curse God's people, and as he's overlooking them on the mountaintop, he tries to issue a curse, but instead of a curse, God replaces his words with God's words. And instead of a curse, you hear a blessing come to God's people. And in one of those blessings, Balaam says this. God uses Balaam to say this. He goes, kings will come from these people. Not only will kings come, but from the line of kings, a Messiah will one day come. Years later in the time of the judges, God would take another person out of that same land of Moab. He would take a young, vulnerable, helpless widow named Ruth, and he would use rad her radical faith to join her with another worthy man named Boaz who was from Bethlehem. 
and Ruth and Boaz would have a child named Obed. Obed would have a child named Jesse and Jesse would have a child named David. Right? God is telling David, he goes, you wanted to do a good thing for me. That was in your heart. But I'm telling you, I am at work here. And I've been at work for a long, long time. I'm inviting you to come and be a part of it. Boaz is from, the, from Bethlehem. Bethlehem coming from the tribe of Judah. He's saying that promise I made to Judah all those years ago is being fulfilled today by me with you. You are the first king in the line of Judah and kings are gonna come after you until you get to the point that the perfect king comes, the one whose throne will reign forever. Jesus will come from the line of David. I think David understood the magnitude of what God was trying to explain, that God is at work and he's being invited to come and be a part of it. And then in verse 18, David says this, He responds to God in this way. He sat before the Lord and said, who am I, O Lord God, and what is my house that you have brought me thus far? And yet this was a small thing in your eyes, O Lord God. You have spoken also of your servant's house for a great while to come. And this is instruction for mankind, O Lord God. What David is saying later on, he goes, if your will is to use me in this way, may your will be done. It is so great, but may your will be done. I think the reason that this story stuck out so much to me that morning, that God used the story in the way he did, was because I feel like God is in a season right now in our church, in the midst of this Go campaign, where he's telling us he is up to something. God is the one who is at work and he's inviting all of us to come along and be a part of it. And I genuinely really believe that. I believe it because God has taught us how to discern his will. He's taught us to come to him daily in prayer, in the study of his word, to make sure we get aligned to his will. And I've seen our elders and our leaders and our pastors and you in our congregation, I've seen you follow that command to go to God daily in prayer and the study of the word. If you remember, David went to the prophet at that time when he wanted to build the house for God to seek counsel. That was how those guys did it at that time. Now we have the word of God and we have access to God the Father at all times, right? We wanna go daily in prayer and I've seen us do that. I've also looked around, and as I look at what God is doing in this place, you find that there are, sometimes we want to go and do things outside the commands of God. Just like David wanted to go and build the house, and God said, no, 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 have I ever commanded you to do that? We need to make sure that anything we ever do as a church, any commitment we make, is within the commands that God gives the church in the New Testament. And everything that we have prayed for and looked for and done as a part of this campaign is within the commands that God has given us. He's told us to go out and make disciples of all nations. Go and preach the word. Go and serve the most vulnerable of these. Everything in this campaign is within those commands. And then lastly, I would say that sometimes you know when God's at work. Because sometimes God does things that only God can do. Right? Only God can convict us of our sin. Only God can lead us to the righteousness of Christ. Only God can transform lives in the name of Christ. What we see going on in the prisons right now, men coming to Christ, that doesn't happen by the power of man. We see so many people coming to Christ out at Edmond right now, that doesn't happen by the power of man. God has invited us at this point in time to get involved in the Children's Rehabilitation Center, to get involved in that hospital. And and he wants us to come be a part of his work today. But if you go and you talk to the leaders of that hospital, if you talk to the volunteers and the patients and all the people who have been a part of that place for so long, you'll find that God's been a part of that place for decades. One of the other pieces we have in this campaign is something we call digital ministry. And digital ministry is something that not everyone really understands. I have to explain it a lot. 
I want you to think about our preaching and our teaching content and our worship music that we do. Think about our, our Bible curriculums and everything we're able to put together. We wanna be able to utilize that inside our body but also outside these walls. We want people in our country, around the globe, to hear great preaching and teaching and worship. We wanna allow small churches all across this country who don't have the resources that we happen to have to have access to incredible, incredible, incredible biblical content. Right. And every now and then, God gives you a little glimpse. And Mar the way Marty says this, and you always have to be careful when you quote Marty, right? But the way, the way Marty says this is he goes, God's just showing off. And we had a bit of a God just showing off moment here in our church. See, we had a, a gentleman in our church who was traveling to Cairo, Egypt, not too long ago. And while he was in Cairo, he was, he was out to, for a dinner, and he sat down at his table, and a waitress came up to talk to him. And she goes, well, where are you from? And, and he says, well, I'm from the United States. I'm from Oklahoma. She goes, oh, Oklahoma. She goes, well, where in Oklahoma? He goes, well, I'm from this place called Oklahoma City. She goes, oh, I know Oklahoma City. She goes, I've been following this teacher, teaching pastor out of Oklahoma City. He really likes maps. Have you ever heard of this Terry Fakes guy? Now, I don't know if she said the whole thing about the maps, but it'd be really cool if she did. In the middle of Cairo, Egypt, some young woman was hearing the word of God taught by our Terry Fakes, right? Hallelujah. How amazing is that? So that's what we are after here. Everything we are doing is in the command of God. We've been prayerful in discerning God's will. We're looking and we're seeing God moving. We see God at work and we just wanna go be a part of what he's doing versus asking God to come along and be a part of what we think is right. I wanna get back to the text as we conclude this text. Because if you truly believe what I believe, that God is at work right now in our church, if you truly believe that, you need to see how this story ends. Because David gives some incredible guidance to his son Solomon later on in his life as this story concludes. So the years are gonna go past, David's gonna reign over Israel. And when he gets to his final days, God is gonna tell him, it is in my will to have this temple built. It just won't be built by you. It's gonna be built by your son Solomon. But David, your son Solomon is young and he's inexperienced and he needs your wisdom. I want you to gather all the resources for him. I want you to get everything ready. I want you to get the stone cutters lined out, get the stone cut, get the priests lined out, get the worship leaders, get everyone ready to build this great temple that will will take seven years to construct. And as David is doing everything that God has commanded him, he gets everything ready, and then in front of the entire assembly of Israel, David calls the, the priests and the heads of the tribes and all the people who'll be working on the effort. He calls them all together, and in front of them, he is handing over the plans of the temple to Solomon. He's handing over the resources. He's handing over his throne to Solomon before he dies. And he gives his son Solomon this guidance that we all need to understand if we're gonna try to understand how we are gonna be a part of what God is doing. If you flip to 1 Chronicles chapter 28, you'll see in verse nine that the first piece of guidance David gives Solomon is this. He goes, and you, Solomon, my son, know the God of your father and serve him with a whole heart and with a willing mind. Know the God of your father. I think it is so telling that the first piece of guidance that David gives is to make sure before you do anything else that you know the God of your father. How often do we steer away from knowing our God? Right? God has taught us how it is that we need to know him, how it is we need to know his voice. We have to spend time with him. It's that simple. Right? He's given us his word. He's given us access to him in prayer. He's given us participation in the body of Christ called the church. We need to spend time with him. Just like Jesus would use the illustration of the shepherds all the time and the sheep. You know, a lot of times you would see many shepherds have all their sheep together in one area, in one pasture. But the sheep had spent so much time with their shepherd that whenever their shepherd called, only the sheep for that shepherd would come. Right? They knew the voice so well. If we are not in our word daily, we will start to lose sight of God's voice and we will replace his voice with our voice. And how quickly will we start to do what is right in our own eyes versus doing what is right in the eyes of God. 
That's the first piece of guidance David gives his son. And then the second piece of guidance is this. He tells Solomon, he goes, be careful now. Interesting words, be careful now. Make sure you understand this, Solomon. Understand what I'm getting ready to tell you. For the Lord has chosen you to build a house for the sanctuary. The Lord has chosen you. This is his work, and he has chosen you to be a part of it. Once you understand that, then do what he says. He goes, be strong and do it. Be strong and do the work. God has chosen this church to be a part of what he is doing in his kingdom for his power and his will. He has chosen this church. And he has chosen you to play some part in that today. What has God chosen you to do? Be careful and understand that the Lord has chosen you to do something for his kingdom, for his purposes. I wanted to end this sermon today in prayer. And I thought the best way to end this sermon in prayer would be to use words that were not my own. You see, David, whenever he had given this guidance to Solomon, he gathered everyone in the assembly together. And everyone came forward and they gave of their resources and they provided everything that was required to do the work of God, to construct the temple. And they gave joyfully and willfully and they all rejoiced together. It said the people rejoiced and David rejoiced. And then as he's handing over all of this information, all these plans, all the kingdom to Solomon, he steps forward into the assembly and he gives the people of Israel these words as they're about to embark upon being a huge part of what God is doing. If we could, I'd like us to stand and I wanna pray the words that God gave David that day over us as a church. It says, David blessed the Lord in the presence of all the assembly and then he said this. Let me pray. Blessed are you, O Lord, the God of Israel, our Father forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come from you and you rule over all. In your hand are power and might, and in your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. And now we thank you, our God, and we praise your glorious name. But who am I, and what is my people, that we should be able thus to offer willingly? For all things come from you, and of you we have given. Father, may you be with this church today. May you be with this body of Christ that you call crossings. May you help us understand that it is not our work being done, it is your work being done. And in your love, you're inviting us to be a part of it. May we know that what your hand controls is better than anything we could imagine. May we submit to being part of it, to being part of whatever it is you have chosen each of us to do. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. May you have a great day. Bless, have a great Sunday.